Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Aquarium Online here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. My name is Alicia, and we're going to be talking today all about fish. We're going to be taking a in-depth look at a specific type of fish. Now, as we do our fish dissection today, uh, if you have questions, you have uh, things that you would like to mention, you can always call or, uh, sorry, text us. We have our text number here, and I have Luke in the studio and my friend Dave. They'll put up the, the number for you, and that's 562-286-1838. If we have already uh, published this to YouTube and you're watching at a later time, then you can always email at live at LBAOP. We'd love to hear from you. Now, just rem just make sure that you have permission from an adult if you are texting as normal rates do apply for those text messages. All right, so we are very excited to join you today. We're going to be doing, again, uh, what we call a dissection. Now, before we cut open our, our mackerel, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this animal. So maybe we can go to its habitat. It's, we can find it, at least locally, right off of our coast. So we have our webcam, our Blue Cavern webcam. Um, oh, <laughs> that's okay. Luke just put up a kelp forest habitat, which is uh, a habitat that is um, one of those spaces that you can find the Pacific mackerel. But this animal is also found pretty much throughout the Pacific Ocean. There are, uh, the mackerel has lots of different species, including the Pacific mackerel, and uh, generally you can find it in Southern California all the way up into the cold waters of Alaska. And we'll, we'll get a close-up view in, in just a moment, but they average around a foot long, so about 12 inches, but they have been recorded at about 25 inches, so just over that two feet in length, which is a, that would be a pretty big mackerel. And then uh, also max size at about six pounds. And they average, ma they uh, believe that mackerel average about 12 years in their lifespan. Now, as we explore, we're gonna start looking at what we call the outside or external body parts first, because there is so much to learn just by looking on the outside of this animal. In some of our other classes, we're looking at pictures. I have my document camera, and we have some mackerel that were frozen. We recently defrosted them, and we're gonna look up close to see what we notice about just the outside of this animal. So we'll go over to our document camera, Ta-da, here's my hands. And we're gonna be looking at just the outside of this animal. Looks like we have a little bit of a delay. It's, I think it's gonna catch up here for us. And what do you notice? Any special patterns for the colors? Well, this is a, a faster swimming fish. And right off the bat, you can kind of see that it has this kind of football shape to its body. This is called a fusiform body shape. It's thicker, has a um, pretty strong, thick body to it. And the, the fins, let's take a look at the fins. So I said it's a faster animal. If I move the, the tail up here, what do you notice about this tail? And I'll give you a chance to respond if you would like to respond and we'll come back to this tail. But what could we, what could the tail maybe give us in a sense of um, kind of clues. Also, what do you notice about the top of this animal and the fins? Yeah, do you see? It has what we call these little finlets. And we were um, just discussing before the class that these little finlets are really unique because, uh, you know, we have these, we'll show you in a minute, these dorsal fins on the very top. By the way, this is the dorsal side of our fish. But these extra little finlets, these tiny fins here, help kind of create a little bit of resistance in the water so that this tail can move back and forth uh, and push off a little bit faster. So if you are, if you were guessing this tail, you probably noticed that it was a little bit forked. So some animals have a more broad shaped tail. And when we go back and maybe view the, the habitat that we were just looking at, we might see another couple animals in there and, and notice their tails. The Mac, oh, I'm gonna turn, the, I'll turn the brightness down here so that it's not so shiny. Hopefully that helps out a little bit. Whoop, 
catching up. We'll do a little bit brighter. Thank you. There are a few people watching who are helping me out there on the view. So this is a forked tail. And that fork actually helps um, also with that resistance. So if I'm, no, this is the tail of my fish and I'm moving back and forth, a nice broad shaped tail that's um, kind of connected all the way around is for strong movements back and forth, but maybe not as fast. So our big giant sea bass has that. Uh, maybe we can pull up a picture of a giant sea bass to kind of show you in comparison. If you have a forked tail, you're able to cut through the water a little bit faster. There are even scuba diving fins that are forked. I have a pair of scuba diving um, fins that I wear and they're split fins and that helps uh, cut through the water a little bit easier. There's a lot of dive equipment that actually mimics a lot of these fish adaptations. So Braden asked, what is their population? Yeah, their, their populations off our coast are doing pretty good. Oh, look. Yay, we're looking at lots of different kinds of body shapes right now. So there goes our eel. Hello, eel. And then we have our giant sea bass. Oh, the eel definitely wants to <laughs> be in the limelight here. And then you can see that the giant sea bass has this really broad tail. No forks. Same thing with our little opal eye back here. So having that forked tail, there's some forked tailed fish in the back here allows them to move very quickly through the water. So if you're watching um, any of our webcams, you can kind of see who might be a little bit slower moving, but stronger. So this is a very big animal, um, close to, you know, our giant sea bass are in the hundreds and 200 pound range. They're pushing themselves through. You know, I'm not sure in the exact numbers of fish, but I do know that the Pacific mackerel is doing pretty well, and it's part of our commercial and recreational fisheries right off of our coast here in Southern California. And so they actually make up about 40% of those fisheries, which is um, a big number if you think about all the different kinds of fish found off of our coast. That's a great question. Keep the questions coming in. We'll probably put that number back up for you in case you think of something. All right, we're gonna go back to our webcam, sorry, our um, document camera here so I can show you up close again our animal. And we'll keep looking at some of these external parts. So we had mentioned moving through the water. They have this fin that they can lift or retract. This is that dorsal fin. And it's pretty hard. So it has these um, little hard bony plates inside of it to give it some structure as it's moving through. Again, if you're pushing through the water quickly, this helps add some stability so that they're not spinning in the water. And then we have a smaller one down at the bottom here. And again, both of these kind of retract down, which can change how they're moving through the water. And their side fins are much smaller than some other fish. If you think about, let's say, the clownfish. The clownfish has a big kind of rounded side or what we call a pectoral fin. And the pectoral fin for that fish moves up and down. And they're pushing themselves through the water with this. Our mackerel here is pushing themselves mainly with that caudal fin or that tail fin, and they are steering with this nice sleek side pectoral fin. Now again, folded up, they also have at the bottom, this is called their anal fin. Now at the very bottom, as we turn our fish around, we also have, I'm trying to turn my, my light down so that it's a little bit easier to see. I apologize for the reflection here. It's a little hard sometimes. Hopefully that's a little bit easier to see. Right here, um, this is the anal fin. Um, we call this exit right here where they, this kind of um, exit from the animal. This is called the cloaca. It's not an anus and that's because it's used for more than just uh, defecating or using the bathroom, right? So this one exit point here is actually used for using the bathroom or defecating as we call it, right? Um, but it can also be used for releasing eggs or sperm into the water. So that's again called the cloaca. And then over here, this is their pelvic fins. They're um, pretty clear, so they're hard to see, but again, they're, they have these hard um, pieces in them. Did you notice anything about the coloration on this animal? 
hopefully you can see a little bit of you know, those pretty blues and greens. And they have, I think I'll have to turn, play with my lights here to see if I can get the, the lighting. There we go. So they have these little stripes here to help them blend into their habitat. So having a darker coloration on top and lighter on the bottom is called counter shading. Not only are they helping to blend in by, you know, cause they're kind of, during the day they're hunting towards the surface. They spend most of their time around the first, um, anywhere from hundred feet to down to 300 feet. But during the day, they're hunting a lot towards the surface of the water. At night, they come down towards the bottom. But since they're not hiding along the rocks, they need to be able to, to blend in a little bit to make sure that they're not eaten or even to sneak up on their, their prey. So the countershading works where if you look up in the ocean, because the sun's coming down, they blend in with a lighter belly. And if you are looking down, it's darker, so having a darker top helps them blend in. So having these little stripes is even one more step to have them blend in that helps um, break up their coloration. It's called a disruptive coloration. All right. Oh, let's see if we can zoom in here. This is a great look at what we call the lateral line. Let me see how I can zoom in. If you're able, woo. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let it, um, that if the focus is very good. So we're a little behind. There's a little bit of a lag for my camera right now. So it's having me overcompensate just a little bit. I'm going to move up just a tiny bit here. Just a little bit more. Okay. So do you see those little... We're very close to our fish. In fact, we can see two things that I wanted to talk about. We can see the outlines for their scales. So it's a characteristic for uh, many fish. Not all fish have scales, but this fish definitely has small, tight, overlapping scales. These look like tenoid scales in their shape. So there's different um, shapes to these and different names for those shape scales. And then this is the other thing that I wanted to point out. It actually highlights it really nice. They have this line down their body with little pores that are filled with like a gel-like substance. And they have, it's not really a hair, but it looks kind of like a hair or cilia as they call it, that stick out. And it allows them to detect movement in the water. It's really cool. So fish have this lateral line. And whenever there is movement in the water, it tickles those, those little hair-like projections called cilia. And it tells the fish, oh, I should move this way or this way. It is especially important if you are a big group of fish called a school, right? So if you're trying to um, stay together so that it's harder for a predator to pick out one animal, you want to move together as a school. If you've ever wondered, how do they do that without talking to each other? It's because of this lateral line. It's really incredible. They can also use that to detect if there's changes in the water movement for like a predator. So it can use it for their buddies in a school or if there's a predator. All right, so we have lots of great questions here. Oh, and just to add in, um, commercial fishing earns between 500,000 and 2 million uh, in a year. Uh, two mil is that 2 million? Sorry, Dave's writing me notes here so I can add into the conversation. 3,000 to 11,000. Oh, okay, so commercial fi fishing earns between 500,000 and 2 million, in, and that brings in um, 3,000 to 11,000 metric tons. And that's when we talk about the commercial fishery for uh, the mackerel. And Sage wants to know what mackerel eat. That is a great transition. So if we wanna know more about what an animal eats, right, we look at their mouth. So let's go ahead. <laughs> Hopefully we're not making ourselves dizzy here by zooming in and out too much. So bear with me. You can see how small this is. Ah, the delay on my camera makes it hard for me to know which direction I'm in. All right, we're moving out, we're moving out. And next we're gonna look at the mouth of our fish. 
Now, I think last time we did a dissection, there was a great question. If, if we look inside, do we find a tongue? Well, let's take a look. This little thing here, yep, that's the tongue. They do have tongue. Many fish do have tongues. So they would be able to um, not only grab their food, but that tongue helps them move the food towards the back of their, their mouth. Now I'm touching their mouth and what I'm noticing, but it might be hard for, for you to see, is that they have a lot of little ridges there to also make sure that their food doesn't escape to the back out their mouth. So mackerel are eating things like plankton, when they're, especially when they're much, much smaller, little babies called fry. And they're grabbing these tiny little drifting plants and animals, and they're using a special part of their gills to filter feed. Now, as they get older, they can start to grab things like small fish and even um, small squid that are swimming around. Sometimes we even find uh, scales and squid parts inside the stomach as we're looking inside. So food, would, food and water that they're breathing goes inside of their mouth, and you'll see that it has this ex extension around their mouth to make sure that the water is going all the way in. And then as it moves through, it's gonna go over their gills. So next, let's take a look at their gills. This thing right here is protecting their gills. This is called the operculum. And the operculum is a hard plate. And in order to look inside, I'm actually going to cut away the operculum and you'd want this to be nice and hard because the gills are really soft. And maybe while I'm do this, I can have Luke get ready our breathing graphic we have. We have a whole team in here, which is, which is wonderful. Okay, so let me see if we can see that in the light a little bit better. So here's the, here's the gills. Here are the gills. And they make this little arch over the top. And we're going to go ahead and play a little video to show you how the water moves through the mouth and then over the gills. It's going to show you the gill arch. It's going to show you the place where oxygen, which is what they breathe, is, is absorbed. And that's these little filaments. It's also going to show you the front of the gills, which I'd like to maybe remove and then zoom in to show you because they're pretty cool. So not only... Not only are the gill filaments helping the fish breathe by absorbing oxygen, but we're gonna take a close-up look. So here are the filaments and they're really thin. And then in front, this is the food grabbing piece. These are called gill rakers. And they're pretty cool. Everything from this mackerel to whale sharks, these planktivores, these plankton eating fish have these special extensions and they can be shaped a little bit different depending on how much they rely on eating plankton. So this is an adaptation for filtering water and grabbing food. So in order to take a closer look, I'm just gonna snip off a piece for you. And these are layered, they're one on top of each other, so they're nice and thick. So as water is quickly passing by, there's lots of opportunity for the gill filaments to absorb oxygen, which is then moved towards, okay, so that was messy. That happens when you do a dissection. All right, and what I wanted to show you were these ridges here. So this is where they're catching their food. I'm gonna see if I can lay it down flat on here so that we can zoom in with our pretty incredible document camera and see the, the filaments. Yay, okay, it's goopy, it's goopy. So we can see those short, so our mackerel here has some of these shorter gill rakers. This is what's catching the, the plankton. And then you can see some extended ones. Do you see how there are li these little barbs? So plankton just swimming around being little plankton, have no idea that this fish is coming by and just whoop, is be able to scoop up some of those little animals that are floating around. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna zoom uh, back out and we'll kind of trace this path. 
Uh, maybe we'll take a second to answer some, some questions. So uh, Natalie asked, why do fish have scales? That's a great question. And again, not all fish have scales, but many fish have scales and they offer a layer of protection. So they have a, a special material, it's like plating, armor plating around their body. And then um, Sage asks, what eats mackerel? Well, <laughs> many things eat mackerel, including people, sea lions, other fish, birds. Uh, they're a nice snack size fish. So they're, they've got a, a lot of nice meat in them and it's an, they're, <laughs> They're, you know, I hate to call it this, but I always say the chicken nugget animal, right? They're, they're right there in the middle of the food web, so a lot of animals eat them. And then uh, Dane asks, how many bones do mackerel have, and do all fish have the same number of bones? Dane, what a great question. You stumped me. I don't know. That's a great question. I do have a feeling, though, that the number of bones may be different because there is such a diversity of fish out there. There's over 25,000 different kinds of fish in the ocean, and that's just what we've discovered so far. That's not even the total number, I'm sure, that exists out there in the ocean. That's a great question. Maybe if someone else knows the answer and they want to text us in and give us the answer, or they want to look it up and email us later, we'd love to know the answer. Um, you can ask, uh, oh, hi to Hilo. Um, how do you tell a male from a female? That's a great question. We're going to actually take a peek now on the internal anatomy of our fish. And, you know, there's not a, a big difference between what we see on the outside for males and females. And really, we don't know the answer usually for fish that are trying to look all the same in their school unless they're ready to spawn. And to spawn means to reduce, sorry, release their eggs into the water. So males are releasing sperm and females are releasing eggs. And they're hoping that in that big cloud, the uh, sperm fertilizes the eggs, right? And then you have a little egg that's fertilized and eventually in about four to five days you will get a little hatched fish fry, a mackerel fry as they call them. Isn't that cute? So um, I think if, if, you had a, if you had a way to look under the microscope and you were looking at the, the gonads which produce eggs or sperm, you would be able to tell. I don't have that capability but I will show you kind of what that looks like on the inside. Great question. And then uh, I, think, I think that's all the questions that have come up so far. Keep asking. That's wonderful. We're going to go back to our document cam. Now I'm going to try to prepare you because <laughs> we're changing views. I have cheated a little bit and I have cut open our fish. I have another fish. Um, just to make things a little bit easier here and to keep on time. But I'll warn you that whenever you cut open an animal, it's a little juicy. Okay, you ready for this, everybody? Okay, so here's, here's another friend mackerel. This one's been cut open. And you have to imagine now that we've gone through the mouth, we've taken in some of that oxygen. Where does that oxygen go next? Well, if you think about our own bodies, right? When we are breathing in, we're breathing into lungs. We don't have gills, but we're taking that oxygen and it gets into our, our blood and then it goes to our heart that helps move that through our body. So let's take a look at where the heart is since we've already looked at how they're grabbing all of that oxygen from the water. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Again, there's a little bit of a lag here, so hopefully it doesn't do it too much. And maybe if I bring my light down just a little bit. Is that better? All looks goopy? Okay. Well, we're going to try. They have a four-chambered heart, and it looks to me like a little pyramid. Dave's telling me two. All right, well, we'll have to look at that. So they have this little, 
they have this heart here and it moves all of that blood. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see that, Luke? Yeah. It's hard when you have everything kind of the same color in here. But we're going to we're going to try our best to see what that looks like. Now the There we go. A little bit of brightness. All right. So here's the here's the heart and then that's going to move throughout the body. So what's next to it? Well, if you're eating, the food's going to go through kind of a process of digestion. So our liver, which is what's kind of in front of us here, this thing right here, helps in digestion. It also helps um, what we call emulsify or stick together all the fats from what it's eating. It can also help bring together um, vitamins and other essential things from the food that the, the mackerel is eating and make sure that that's available for the mackerel. So a liver is nice. In a shark, a liver is going to be much, much uh, bigger, about the third of its total body weight because the liver in a shark is very oily and helps the shark float, which is pretty cool. Um, our mackerel friend here doesn't need the liver to float because right under here, it's hard to see, but there is a, it looks like just a bag. Now, if it was a little drier, we would see that this little bag-like thing, it's like a balloon, it's called a swim bladder, and it helps the fish float in the water. Now, a big part of what we're seeing here, this thing right here, this is that gonad. So if it was a female, it'd be producing eggs. And if it was a male, it'd be producing sperm. And it connects to that cloaca, which would have been right down here. And again, when they're ready to have their babies, they just release right through that same opening as if um, at, that's kind of a one way, a one exit for, for everything. Now, continuing our discussion for digestion, we have that, that liver. And then underneath that, we have these little, this piece here, before it reaches the intestines and the stomach, it's called a pyloric cecum. And this pyloric cecum helps absorb nutrients, kind of like our intestines do. So instead of having the small and large intestines, they kind of have this specialized thing called a pyloric cecum. And then it moves to the stomach, which is down here. We're not going to open up the stomach because, honestly, it's a little gross for me. <laughs> but sometimes we can open it up and uh, see if there's any food in there. Dave wants me to open it, but I, I'm going to pass today because of, of time, Dave. We don't have enough time. Yeah, oh, it's a shame. It's a shame. Um, and so you would be seeing, you'd be seeing a lot of this... Um, or sorry, you would be seeing the gonads on the other side. Something we're not quite seeing, but it's kind of tucked away up here is the kidneys. So they have kidneys like we do. Yep, so there's the digestive path. And again, uh, what it doesn't use and absorb in its body would be uh, moving towards um, the cloaca to exit. All right, so there was a very uh, gooey look at the inside pieces here. We have some questions. Maybe we can go to our Blue Cavern exhibit. And we can answer some of these questions here. Sage asks, are there fish without scales? That's a great question. In fact, we saw one swimming through the exhibit earlier. We saw that big moray eel. And I think we have a picture of a, of a moray eel that we can put up. And so the moray eel, you know, it is moving along the rocks quite a bit and, and scraping up against the rocks in its home naturally. So having scales may not be to its benefit. Having more like a skin is a little bit easier to, to maneuver back and forth within the rock so it's not constantly scraping. The fish who are using their scales, um, a lot of them are kind of open water or not living in these tiny little nooks and crannies. And also the cabazon, which is another, um, another type of, of local fish. And I think we have a, a frogfish um, picture from a tropical habitat, also living at the bottom. Isn't this great? So the frogfish, um, to my knowledge, doesn't have the same type of scale structure 
on its body. It's a little bit more skin-like on the outside. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh, okay, so Dave helped clarify what I was saying here. Fish hearts have two chambers, but four parts. So that's um, a nice clarification for us. Pika asks, are mackerels born with all the colors that they have? Um, they do have, I believe, the counter shading, but I'm not sure if those uh, nice little zigzag shapes are as prominent as when they are a little bit older. Uh, Seth asked, mackerels, major predators? I think we kind of answered that a little bit earlier, right? Anything that can get its fins mouth on <laughs> the mackerel flippers uh, will eat it. It's, again, kind of depending on how old it is, moves from being very tiny to bigger and bigger on the food web. So less things eat it as it gets to that, you know, foot long uh, size, but there's still lots and lots of predators. It's kind of, again, just an, an easy target for lots of animals. They use their schooling behavior, their coloration, and they're really fast, uh, you know, their sleek bodies to move really fast to help avoid predators. But again, they do, as they get older, move up on their on the food web. So they're eating bigger and bigger prey. Another question was, do mackerels change sex? You know, a lot of uh, ocean animals do. I think we have our Antheus exhibit that Luke can put in for us um, when he has a chance. That's an example, or even back to Blue Cavern, there's a lot of animals in the ocean that are born male and will turn to female or start life as female and turn to male. To my knowledge, mackerel do not do that. They have um, kind of a one, one path as soon as they're, they're born. Another question that came in from Audrey, uh, are fish blind? That's a great question because there are so many different habitats in the ocean. Not all fish rely on their eyesight. Some fish have very poor eyesight like the eel we were looking at. And some fish that are in the deep ocean, they have other senses that they use to navigate. They don't need their eyesight. So um, yes, there are some, some fish that have no eyes or have very poor eyesight. Um, and Juliet asks, are there mutations that make scaleless fish? That's a great question. You know, those, there are mutations that happen all the time, right? So a mutation in a generation of an animal can lead to something. Um, and if it's, if it's an advantage for that animal, it might have more babies, which have more babies that get passed along. So I'm sure at one point um, there are some fish that had a mutation and it turned out that, you know, having no scales for the eel turned out to be a little bit better. So sure, those mutations are important. They happen naturally and that's part of the evolution in, in an animal. Behind me, these are great questions, by the way. Thank you so much, everyone who's watching. Oh, something's happening. Must, maybe it's food time. Snacks, everyone loves snacks. So this is our, our eighth, our Antheus exhibit, and a lot of these fish here change during their lifetime from, uh, from female to male, and it really depends on the structure, their little social structure. So they're a great example. Not all of the animals in here, there's some angel fish, but a lot of the wrasses and uh, the Antheus exhibits. I think I was able to answer most of the questions in here. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I hope you enjoy taking a closer look at some of the wonderful adaptations of the Pacific mackerel. We do have one more class session happening today, and we have much more happening this week. So I hope you continue to join us in our Aquarium Online Academy. Thank you.